Over the last year and a half, something remarkable has happened in El Salvador. Murder rates that were once the worst in the Western Hemisphere have fallen to historic lows. In 2022, that meant the small Central American nation logging a homicide rate only slightly higher than the United States. In 2023, it could fall even below that of Canada, potentially placing El Salvador alongside European countries in terms of safety. Just a decade ago, such a shift would have seemed like a miracle, an impossible dream that could have never survived contact with reality. Yet El Salvador's newfound peace isn't the result of some errant genie granting a wish. It's the result of the Salvadorian state's war on gangs, a crackdown that's caused international outcry, even as it's allowed ordinary people to experience life without fear for the first time in decades. In today's video, we're delving deep into the moral complexities of El Salvador's war on gangs, examining both the newfound freedoms the crackdown has brought, as well as the harsh tactics used in this most brutal of fights. For El Salvador, 2015 represented the grimmest point in an already grim decade. That was the year this tiny Central American nation, smaller than Vermont and with a population of only 6.3 million, recorded the highest murder rate in the world. A wave of killings that would make even the most dangerous US cities look like oases of calm. But while 2015 was notably bad, the rest of this decade was hardly sunshine and unicorns. Throughout the 2010s, El Salvador hovered near the top of the homicide chart, suffering so many killings, rapes, and serious assaults that experts compared the level of violence to active war zones. Yet there was no war in El Salvador, no civil conflict like in Syria, no invasion by a neighboring power like in Ukraine. Instead, El Salvador's ills could be traced back to one highly visible cause, the nation's gangs. In the barrios of San Salvador, in poorer towns away from the capital, groups like Mara Salvatrucha, better known as MS-13, and Barrio 18 held sway. Vast networks of heavily armed criminals who controlled their communities through fear. Broadly, the aim of this control was extortion. While Mexican cartels might make most of their money through the drug trade, El Salvador's gangs were always a little more homespun, collecting their money not from cocaine shipments, but from shakedowns. Say you uh, worked as a taxi driver in San Salvador. For that, your local gang might levy a regular tax of $20 to ensure your vehicle, and thus your livelihood, didn't get destroyed. Or hey, maybe you inherited some money or managed to sell some property. In that case, whoever controlled your street might demand a 50% cut. In these ways, little and large, everyone from homeowners to large businesses were forced to finance the gangs. As for those who refused to pay, well, that's where the sky-high murder rate comes in. Failing to pay any one of the multiple taxes levied by the criminal groups could result not just in violence, but violence on an eye-watering scale. In 2015, 95 employees of transportation companies were murdered when their bosses refused to pay gang taxes. In 2010, MS-13 set fire to a bus from a holdout company, killing 17 passengers. As a result, most people coughed up. The National Transportation Board concluded in 2015 that members of their unions were collectively paying $34 million annually. In 2017, the organization Crisis Group estimated that extortion costs were equivalent to 3% of El Salvador's GDP. As miserable as the shakedowns must have been, though, the real horror of the gangs was their brutality. Cross the wrong street, walk into the wrong neighborhood, and you could be murdered. Do so as a female, you might first be raped. Board gang members with guns were known to take pot shots at passing children. El Faro spoke to a youth soccer coach who had to suspend his club after gang members started shooting towards the kids for fun. And these are just the things that we feel comfortable talking about. Read detailed reports of violence in the barrios, and you'll find stomach-churning details that we simply couldn't include in this video. Still, hopefully even this was enough to give you some idea of the hell ordinary Salvadorians were suffering through, of the moral depravities families had to cope with on a daily basis. Because it's only when you understand that that you'll understand the intense support for the government's crackdown, a crackdown that has brought peace, but only at a terrible cost. The question of whether that cost was worth it or not is something that we'll be trying to answer in the rest of today's video. 
Like so many of El Salvador's problems, the gangs can be blamed, at least in part, on the civil war. From 1979 to 1992, the nation was ripped apart by a conflict between successive hard-right governments and far-left rebels that was defined by atrocity. 75,000 people died, while maybe a quarter of the population fled. Among those refugees were thousands of traumatized youths who swapped the killing fields of their homeland for places like inner-city Los Angeles. There, deprived of opportunities, some began to coalesce into gangs, gangs like MS-13, which was born in LA. But it was only once the war ended that these groups became the stuff of nightmares. Deported back to a war-ravaged nation lacking in opportunities and awash with weapons, they decided to make money the only way they knew how, by inflicting terror. With the state too weak to intervene, El Salvador's gangs quickly expanded. By the 2010s, it's estimated that 70,000 people, 1% of the entire population, were members. Rather than fight so many criminals, the government tried to negotiate. In return for toning down the violence, imprisoned members would receive special treatment. Occasionally, these negotiations worked, like in 2013, when the murder rate dropped to a post-Civil War low. Other times, they failed spectacularly, like when homicides skyrocketed in 2015. Mostly, though, the violence just kept chugging along, always there, ever-present in people's lives, a shadow of fear stalking everything the impoverished majority did. That this ever changed, the reason we're making this video, is broadly down to one man, Naib Bukele. If you've heard of Bukele, it might be because, as president of El Salvador, he famously made Bitcoin legal tender. For our purposes today, though, what's important about Bukele isn't his tech bro sheen or his background in advertising or his comparative youth. No, what matters are his dictatorial tendencies. Now, before you report us for slander, just know that Bukele himself has self-described himself as the world's coolest dictator. And nor is he really lying. After winning the 2019 presidential election as a populist outsider, Bukele set about dismantling El Salvador's checks and balances, centralizing power, packing the Supreme Court, and turning the legislature into a rubber stamp body. He's since used this stranglehold to sidestep the Constitution's one-turn limit and allow himself to run for re-election. But while this is all pretty awful from the standpoint of things like legality, the takeover did have one advantage. It allowed Bukele to launch his ferocious anti-gang crackdown. The operation began in March of 2022. Over a single weekend, the gangs ran riot, murdering a combined 87 people in what was apparently a warning to Bukele after secret talks between the government and outfits like MS-13 broke down. Rather than in return to negotiations, though, the government rammed through a state of emergency. As the Narcopolitics blog by journalist Arwen Grio notes, initially the offensive looked like it could be a repeat of other efforts, known as Mano Dura, or Hard Hand, in which troops shot up and arrested Mara's gang members for a stint, but their structures survived. Yet as months progressed, Bukele's offensive proved different, even more so than in Mexico's drug war. The state went in hard. Homes were raided, suspected gang members dragged away. In December of 2022, the city of Surapango was even put under siege. 10,000 troops cut it off from the outside world, while soldiers went door to door, arresting everyone even vaguely tied to the gangs. By the time the state of exception had been in place for one year, some 65,000 people had been imprisoned, a number that's since only grown. Adjusted for population, that would be the equivalent of 3 million Americans being detained in 12 months. Combined with the pre-existing prison population, that means almost 2% of the adult population is now behind bars. That gives El Salvador the highest incarceration rate in the world. Higher than the US, higher than China, higher than any other modern state. We'll come on to what that means for things like overcrowding and human rights in a later part of today's video. But before we go into that, though, we want to take a brief detour to discuss something both very important and very controversial. The way this brutal crackdown has improved life for millions of people. In February of 2023, The Guardian visited the city of Sonopango to see what life was like post-siege. What they found was a vision of peace. Once a hotspot for criminal activities, Sonopango was now quiet, calm. Gang graffiti had been painted over. No masked thugs lurked on street corners. No gunshots rang out. Speaking to the reporter, a local woman declared of this new state of affairs, It's excellent because we feel safer. We can move around more freely. People visit us more. People who didn't come over now do. Other newspapers have reported similar scenes. The anti Bukele El Faro visited Las Cañas in Ayapango and wrote about a community once divided between rival gangs that's now able to come together and play a local soccer match. 
After visiting 13 other former strongholds of MS-13 and Barrio 18 and finding more of the same, their reporter wrote, The conclusion is that the gangs do not exist in this moment as El Salvador knew them for decades. In their place, they instead found communities living ordinary lives for the first time in generations, local businesses reporting that extortion taxes had dropped anywhere from 70 to 95%. One head of a transport company even felt able to boast that, Today, if I have problems in Las Margaritas, I file a report and the government goes and shakes them up. The gangs no longer even dare to call you. For many used to living under the gang's dictate of see, hear, and shut up, such a statement would have long seemed incredible, if not impossible. Yet the evidence is that it really was possible. The gangs seem to have vanished. It's a change visible not just in anecdotes, but also in the raw numbers. The year before Bukele was elected, El Salvador's murder rate stood at 51 per 100,000 citizens, far lower than the 2015 peak of 103, but still abnormally high. Mexico, for comparison, recorded a rate of just 25.8 that year. In Latin America, only Venezuela was more dangerous. Now, that rate fell even before the state of exception began. In 2021, it reached an all-time low of 18.1, about on par with Brazil. But the war on gangs seems to have turbocharged that decline. 2022 saw El Salvador's murder rate plunge to just 7.8 per 100,000. That's only a little above America's rate of 6.3. Since then, it's fallen even lower. If the government's figures are to be believed, 2023 should see homicides drop to just 2.2 per 100,000, which is lower even than Canada. Now, we should be clear that not everyone believes the government's figures. San Salvador has stopped publishing detailed homicide data, and opposition figures like Celia Medrano have accused Bukele of massaging the figures. Still, even if the government is deliberately underreporting the murder rate, and it's really closer on being on par with America than Canada, there's still no doubt that 2022 and 2023 remain the safest years on record. And that's led to all sorts of tangible benefits. At the local level, people once forbidden to visit relatives in territory controlled by rival gangs are now able to see their cousins, brothers, aunts, and nieces again. Kids can play in the street without having to worry about stray bullets. All of which explains what polling has shown again and again. Salvadorans really like what's happening. A 2022 Gallup poll found 78% of the public supported the war on gangs a lot, with another 13% somewhat supporting it, versus just 4% against. President Bukele's approval rating, meanwhile, hovers around 85%. To find a US president to enjoy figures like that, you need to go back to the immediate aftermath of 9-11, when Americans rallied around George W. Bush. Yet, for all of the clear, undoubted improvements Bukele's approach has brought, it hasn't been without cost. It's time to hear the other side of today's story, the dark compromises the government has made in its war on gangs to ensure victory. You've probably seen the photos on social media. Hundreds of heavily tattooed men with shaved heads sitting under the glare of harsh lights, forced to huddle in rows as armed guards ensure no one moves out of line. Taken in the brand new Center for Confinement of Terrorism, or CECOT, such images are part of El Salvador's publicity drive for its crackdown. A stark warning to gang members that decades of this treatment is what awaits them all. Yet while these photos caused uproar in some quarters and cheering in others, they don't tell the whole truth. Because the simple fact is that you cannot imprison over 65,000 people in 20 months without ignoring things like due process and human rights. Multiple sources report accused gang members being mass tried in groups of up to 900, with no opportunities to prepare or present a defense. And that means that among the hardened criminals, there are likely thousands of people now rotting in El Salvador's squalid jails who shouldn't even be there. Rights groups have documented some of the various reasons people have been locked up under Bukele. They range from having a tattoo to looking nervous. Worse, the Washington Post reports that many neighbors with grudges to bear are using the crackdown as an excuse to get rid of those that they don't like, making false accusations in the knowledge that the courts won't bother to check. In a survey by Salvadoran Institute IUDOP this year, 34% said that they knew someone innocent who'd been swept up in the dragnet. And that's not including those who exist in the gray area between gang member and civilian. As people who live in wealthy Western nations, it can be hard for us to grasp that concept. Surely, you're either part of a gang or you're not a part of a gang. But this underestimates the way El Salvador's criminal groups utterly penetrated society. Otherwise, ordinary people were made to act as drivers for the gangs, on pain of death. Others were forced to help fund their activities. 
Now some of them have been swept up along with the very people who'd been threatening them. Spanish daily Al Pais carried a recent story on a transport company owner who was extorted by the gangs and then arrested for funding them. For those innocents caught up in this, this experience must be akin to a season in hell. Rather than being let out on bail to prepare for their trial, those arrested are kept in overcrowded cells, where as many as 170 may share just two toilets. The guards overseeing these squalid conditions deliver savage beatings. By August this year, rights group Christosar reported 181 inmates had been killed in Salvadoran jails. Some died from injuries, some even starved to death. Among those living through this horror are over 1,000 minors, with kids as young as 12 tried as adults in the new courts dozens of middle schoolers are thought to be among those arrested. To be fair to the government, they have recently begun to acknowledge mistakes. Up to 7,000 wrongly accused prisoners have now been released, although it's thought there may still be more trapped in the system. With no known database of those arrested and files related to the state of exception classified, families often have no way of knowing what those jailed are even accused of. And speaking of families, the wave of arrests has placed a harsh financial burden on many. With the government allowing imprisoned gang members just one tortilla and egg to eat per day, mothers, wives, and children on the outside are forced to pay for monthly packages to stop their relatives from starving. According to New Humanitarian, these jail packages cost anywhere from $17 to $120. For those at the bottom of the income ladder, their entire monthly wage might be as little as $365. So, yes. I hope we can all agree that being swept up in this crackdown must be horrific, both for innocents arrested and for family members left behind. And yet, for all of the threat of arrest now hangs over the nation's young men, polling suggests this is a price Salvadorans are willing to pay. In a recent interview, the editor of investigative journalism Alfred Alfaro, Oscar Martinez, explained it this way. One may ask, how can it be that people still love him, Bukele, even though his government has arrested so many innocent people, and if there is so much suffering in jails? It is because people didn't live in a democracy. They never have. They lived in a criminal regime where gangs raped their children. So now, the state of emergency is the lesser evil. There are people who will accept having their son arrested if it means gangs won't be in their neighborhood. Nor are these people only living in El Salvador. It's time to turn to the most intriguing part of today's episode, the growing interest in many neighboring countries of importing Bukele's version of justice. If you don't follow the news closely, you might not be aware that parts of Latin America are experiencing a surge in violence. While homicide rates in places like Mexico remain steady and are even falling slightly in countries like Brazil, once safe nations are currently being shaken by a spike in killings. Costa Rica is on track to suffer its most murderous year in modern history. Chile has gone from being less murderous than the United States to more so. Ecuador, meanwhile, has become more dangerous than either Brazil or Mexico. Across Latin America, more broadly, a sense of safety seems to be crumbling. Over half of people polled in Colombia, Chile, Ecuador, Ecuador and other regional democracies reported feeling unsafe walking home at night. That compares to just a quarter of respondents in the USA. In many countries, the driving factor seems to be an increase in gang crime, often linked to drug shipping routes. All of which may explain why Nayib Bukele's popularity has exploded across the Americas. The Economist reports a swell of support for Bukele in many parts of Latin America, a support not driven by his love of crypto or dank memes, but specifically by his harsh crackdown. As the magazine explains, faced with ever more powerful gangs, many Latin Americans appear to think sacrificing civil rights is a price worth paying for security. This is translated into action at the ballot box. In October, Ecuadorians elected their own Bukele, the 35-year-old Daniel Neboa, who promised his own war on gangs. In Peru, the mayor of Lima, Rafael López Alaaga, has proposed adopting what he calls the Bukele Plan. Whether it's actually possible to import these methods to other nations, though, that's not a matter. As we said earlier, one of the key things that allowed Bukele to launch his war on gangs was a spectacular power grab. In Congress, his New Ideas Party has taken a hatchet to things like the independence of the judiciary, stuffing the Supreme Court and judges and prosecutors' offices with loyalists. This has allowed him to sidestep a provision in the Constitution that limits presidents to a single term, clearing his way for another run next year. At the same time, the media has either been co-opted or intimidated into silence. Alfaro's staff were forced to relocate to Costa Rica after extreme harassment. Political opponents such as Samuel Ramirez likewise complain of being shut down. Speaking to the Washington Post, anthropologist Juan Martinez de Abusion sums things up as such. The Bikini model is this, concentrating all the power in one man. Or as Alfaro's editor bluntly put it, to end the gangs, Bukele also ended democracy. 
That naturally means this model is hard to export. Professor at Florida International University and researcher on gangs and gang violence, Jose Miguel Cruz, recently explained to Al Jazeera that neighboring states likely have too many checks and balances. Quote, Countries like Honduras and Guatemala still have some institutions with enough independence to act as a check on that kind of executive power. In order for this to work, you have to have something like a dictatorship. End quote. It may be telling that the candidate in Guatemala's recent election who promised to emulate Bacali, Sandra Torres, was crushed by her opponent who ran on an anti-corruption platform. Still, it's often hard with these things to predict how they will go from the outside. After all, polls recently showed two-thirds of Salvadorians supporting democracy, yet no one seems to be prepared to go onto the street to stop Bacali's re-election. As we demonstrated earlier, he remains phenomenally popular. But we want to leave behind the wider regional picture now and return to El Salvador. Because there's one major question that we still need to ask, and that's what happens next? Now he's been cleared to run again, it would be a very foolish person who would bet against Bukele winning the 2024 election. That means the war on gangs is certain to continue. It also means El Salvador's communities are likely to remain safe, able to enjoy this moment of peace for at least a few more years. No. When we ask what happens next, we don't mean in the immediate future, we mean in the long term. What might happen over the next decade in a country that's undergone as dramatic a shift as El Salvador? Now, obviously, there's no handy crystal ball that we can look into, so instead, we've read up on what knowledgeable experts and Salvadorans think the future might hold. And, spoiler alert here, their guesses tend to correlate very closely to their general opinions of Bukele. Editor-in-chief of El Faro, Oscar Martinez, is very clear about the next step that he sees coming. Bukele really becomes the dictator he seems to want to be. In a blunt interview with The New Humanitarian, he laid out his thinking. I think this country will turn into a dictatorship. Sooner or later, more people will start feeling unhappy about the acts of repression and the lack of judicial control. And, as it happens when you concede exclusive and absolute power to one man, when Bukele stops hearing praises, uh, we will start hearing military boots. In this telling, the Salvadoran war on gangs has really been a war between two different types of gangs. The street Maras, as represented by Barrio 18 and MS-13, and the super predator of the jungle, in the guise of an increasingly militaristic state. As Salvadorian anthropologist Juan Martinez de Bucion wrote of this new super predator, it's a more efficient and organized criminal form, with superior firepower, the state mafia controlled by President Nayib Bukele. Now, if that's the case, then all we're really witnessing right now is another chapter in a long Latin American saga. One that played out in different ways in the 1960s and 70s, but still ended up with one sunglasses-loving man backed by soldiers ruling his nation with an iron boot. Still, that's not to say that such an outcome is inevitable. There are other myriad ways the situation could develop, some good, some deeply troubling. One floated by journalist Arwan Grio on his blog is also one most people likely overlook. That's the costs of the extended crackdown crippling the South Salvadoran state. Per Grio, time will tell if Bukele's success will last. It's expensive to incarcerate 1.7% of the population, especially in a poor country. He could go bust. To be clear, Grio isn't saying this will necessarily be the case. He also suggests Bukele might instead finish crushing the gangs in El Salvador before helping Honduras do the same. But it does raise the important point that unexpected outcomes can't be dismissed. Another that can't be dismissed is the gangs coming back, or some other form of violence erupting. While the public currently seems happy with the trade-off of fewer human rights for more security, that might not last forever. A long-term crackdown in which innocent family members keep getting swept up might spark riots or even an uprising. Or maybe far better armed cartels will move in and take over the former turf of MS-13 and other gangs. It's worth remembering that Mexico's drug war seemed to be going well at various points before repeatedly spinning back out of control. Oh hey! Maybe this negativity is just us refusing to see the evidence before our eyes. Maybe Bukele really has crushed the gangs for good. Maybe El Salvador's murder rate will now stay at a level comparable with Canada, and decades from now people will look back on Nayib Bukele not as a guy who trampled on the constitution, but as the man who saved his country from a long national nightmare. After all, the central fact remains that El Salvador today is safer than it has been in decades, that millions of people are living lives no longer marked by fear, no longer scarred by violence. Even if only in a utilitarian sense, might the brutal excesses of the state of exception not be a price worth paying for such a reward? It's a question which we don't have the answer for. 
Over the last year with this channel, we've been trying to inch away from the partisanship that seems to be affecting so many outlets. The strange tendency to pick a side and then only report what your viewers want to hear, as if war and politics were some sort of football game. With this video on El Salvador's war on gangs, we wanted to highlight the full moral complexity of what's happening, to make you, hopefully, question your leanings a bit. To make the law and order conservative uneasy about the innocents caught up in the crackdown. To make the natural liberal admit that Bekele's strongman tactics really have improved the lives of many. The downside is that this means there's no easy moral lesson that we can end this on a pithy line I can throw out that wake us all feeling rather comfortable, reinforced in our beliefs. Because the simple truth is that depending on who you talk to, El Salvador today can either be a promise or a warning, a place that finally got its shit together, or a place that's sliding towards authoritarianism. Only the future will tell which of these, if any, turns out to be true.